My name is Ravi Tegarajan. I am the Chief of Cardiac Intensive Care at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, I'm going to discuss with you ECMO use across the world, utilization and trends and outcomes in ECMO, complications related to ECMO, and ECMO used to support cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Ravi Theogarajan. Dr. Theogarajan is the Chief and Callahan Family Chair of Cardiac Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital. He's also Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Ravi, welcome. Jeff, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, speaking to you through Open Pediatrics today. Um, Robbie, could we begin, um, could I ask you, um, what has been your role in ELSO? And uh, more importantly, perhaps for uh, our audience, uh, can you describe uh, ELSO when it was started, what its function is, um, and what it's doing today? So ELSO is the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, and I was the registry co-chair between 2009 and 2015. And as a co-chair, I oversaw the functions of the ECMO registry and uh, made sure that we got the good data from centers that were reporting to it, and also um, and uh, looked after the scientific productivity of the registry. And the functions of, of ELSA, when was it started, and um, you know, what was the original reason to start it? And, and today, if you had to summarize what it does, is it you know, a, a collection of the centers, or is it more for the database, or is it both? So the, uh, ELSA was really started to advance uh, extracorporeal life support therapies, particularly ECMO. Um, and it was started as a registry, because ECMO is done very rarely in most centers, the registry was started as an organization to collect data so that we could improve practice of ECMO. Currently, the registry collects data from over 300 centers from the world and acts as both a scientific repository of data so that we can improve our knowledge of ECMO and the practice of ECMO and also serves as a quality improvement tool for centers that are doing ECMO so that we could improve practice of ECMO in these centers. The registry was started um, by Dr. Bartlett at the University of Michigan and other ECMO providers at that time. It was started in 1989 as an, as an extracorporeal life support organization, but the registry actually predated the organization itself and was started in 1984. Uh, the registry has data from ECMO patients from as far back as 1979 and currently collects data from 300 centers around the world. And it's uh, the uh, registry has been a sing the single most factor that's actually improved care and knowledge of ECMO around the world. The uh, pr scientific productivity from the ELSA registry uh, has helped improve our knowledge of ECMO, and uh, the registry publishes up to you know 10 to 15 articles in peer-reviewed journals each year, um, and has been uh, really the cornerstone of our uh, the way we do ECMO and our thoughts around ECMO. So, Ravi, um, could you walk us through some of the data from the registry uh, as to the status of ECMO around the world today? What do we know about the programs, how many, uh, what patients are going on, et cetera? So through the registry, we're able to understand uh, how ECMO is being used around the world, indications for ECMO, who's using it, utilization of ECMO and trends in utilization, and also outcomes for patients who are supported with ECMO. Uh, so currently, um, ECMO is reported to us, like I said, from 300 or so centers from around the world. There are about 10,000 cases of ECMO reported into the registry each year. There's been a progressive growth in the use of ECMO around the world, uh, especially since 2009 when the H1N1 epidemic was a good nidus for use of ECMO for adults with respiratory failure, and that really has really exponentially increased the use of ECMO around the world. There are also growing number of centers using ECMO, and the, the registry tracks those centers and the data that comes from those centers. ECMO is currently being used for uh, to support both cardiac and respiratory failure in neonates, pediatrics, and in adults. Um, indications for ECMO are gro is growing across all age groups and um, and indications. Perhaps. The, the greatest growth really is in adults, uh, given, the, our, given the success and two clinical trials that were published showing uh, efficacy of ECMO in those populations. Uh, so the growth is really in adults, although one could say that all indications for ECMO are growing. 
Outcomes for ECMO, ECMO is currently being used in patients who have failed conventional therapy. So we only start ECMO in patients who have failed conventional therapies, and therefore their mortality for con continuing conventional therapy is quite high. So when we look at outcomes for ECMO, you have to keep that in mind. And overall, the registry shows that there are about 100,000 or so patients reported to the registry uh, with an overall survival rate of 56%. The survival varies by age and indication for ECMO. Uh, neonates with respiratory failure perhaps have the best survival rates, and that's where ECMO started. And we've continued to show good outcomes for those patients. Children with cardiac disease is a growing indication for ECMO, given that we use ECMO for comp, uh, to support patients who have complex repairs of congenital heart disease. And though uh, survival rates usually range between you know, 40 to 45 percent in that population. And then another growing use of ECMO is really to support failed cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And in those patients, survival rates are between 35 and 40 percent. Uh, so the L registry has helped us understand uh, utilization as well as trends in ECMO use and in their outcomes. Robbie, could, I, could we back up and could I ask you about uh, the growth in adult programs since 2009? Um, as you noted, um, ECMO emerged from the cardiopulmonary bypass world and the initial uh, attempts in adult patients was less successful and it really kind of found a home in pediatric patients and in the newborn population, meconium aspiration in particular, as you noted, um, and less so maybe for congenital diaphragmatic hernia, uh, less successful, uh, but nonetheless, of home and pediatrics. And then 2009, H1N1, and the so-called CSER trial. Can you tell us what did that trial find? Why, why did the adults suddenly refine ECMO in 2009? So the CSER trial was a randomized trial comparing uh, the use of extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation uh, for adults with respiratory failure. Uh, in that trial, adults were randomized to either continuing conventional therapies or being moved to an ECMO center where ECMO therapy was offered. Uh, and the trial really demonstrated that patients who were supported with ECMO had superior outcomes, both uh, survival to hospital discharge and six-month outcomes. And that really was one of the factors that led to increasing interest, at least in the adults, for use of ECMO um, and really spurn the adult uh, growth of ECMO over time. Uh, and really, adults are using ECMO more than children uh, these days. Um, mm. and, uh, and it was largely rooted in the CSER trial as well as the H1N1 experience with the use of ECMO. Ravi, I, I suspect uh our colleagues around the world uh, are interested, as I am now, to um, hear from you in uh, more detail about its current use in the neonatal and the pediatric population. What do we know about that? So I'm going to split this into uh, talking a little bit about respiratory failure and ECMO use for cardiac failure. Um, if you look at um, ECMO for respiratory failure, as illustrated in these graphs, in, uh, we are using less ECMO for neonatal respiratory failure as compared to pediatric respiratory failure, where there's really growth in the use of ECMO. And I think that we're using less ECMO in the neonates, and remember, that's where ECMO started, but we're using less ECMO in neonates primarily because I think there are other therapies such as inhaled nitric oxide and high-frequency jet ventilation or high-frequency oscillation, uh, and those have helped us um, you know, manage neonates very effectively. However, in the pediatric population, similar to adults, we see a growth in use of ECMO in that population. If you look at outcomes for children with respiratory failure, uh, if you look at neonates as shown in this table here, patients who are supported for meconium aspiration have much better outcomes than children supported uh, for congenital diaphragmatic hernia as the reason for respiratory failure. And the reason for that is that um, in meconium aspiration, respiratory failure is a reversible lesion as compared to congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So, ECMO is best used to support something that's reversible, um, as illustrated at least in the neonatal outcomes. If you look at the pediatric population again, children who have viral respiratory illnesses that have a reversible cause may actually have better outcomes than children who have non-reversible causes, and we call them non-infectious ARDS type population. If you look at the type of ECMO that's being used in uh, respiratory failure, 
patients who are supported with VA ECMO do less well compared to those who are supported with veno venous ECMO. Uh, so in VA ECMO, you're actually supporting both the function of the heart and the lungs. It's much more invasive because you're accessing both the venous and the arterial circulation. As compared to veno venous ECMO, where you're only supporting the lung and the only access for ECMO is really the venous circulation. So complications are less, and therefore children do better. In most instances, uh, children uh, with respiratory failure can be supported very well with veno venous ECMO, especially if they have good cardiovascular function. And recent research illustrates that using v, v ECMO is much better than VA ECMO, and that's um, uh, an important distinction. The reason why, um, so this uh, figure illustrates the trends in use of VV ECMO in, in various populations. And as you can see, the adults are largely using VV ECMO for their respiratory failure. It's very rare to use VA ECMO in, in adults with respiratory failure. However, in pediatrics and neonates, the field has been somewhat uh, behind. But in pediatrics, because the you know patients come with different sizes and we're able to use you know adult type equipment, I think you can see that the incidence of use of VB ECMO and respiratory failure is increasing in pediatrics. However, in newborn, uh, since we don't have adequate cannula or, uh, or technology to use VV ECMO effectively, uh, you can see that the graph is pretty flat, uh, and we're still using a lot of VA ECMO in centers. If you get to the cardiac population, the use of ECMO in, to support cardiovascular function, both neonates and pediatrics, is increasing over time. And that largely relates to the fact that we are doing more complex congenital heart surgery in younger children. And ECMO is a really important form of mechanical circulatory support for those patients who need to recover from a big complex operation that's done. So it's increasing both in pediatrics and neonates. If you look at outcomes for children with cardiac failure, Children who have congenital heart disease tend to do less well than acquired forms of heart disease such as myocarditis or cardiomyopathy in um, ECMO use to support heart failure in those indications. Uh, and the reason why uh, children with congenital heart disease do less well is because they've had an operation, you have to support them on ECMO, we have to use anticoagulation in those patients and they perhaps have more bleeding complications. Uh, so. ECMO use is growing across the pediatric population, both for um, respiratory failure and for cardiac failure, except in neonates, where we've seen to have uh, conventional therapies, nitric oxide, and other forms of ventilation that have helped that population. I'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. And the question is this. How do you monitor anticoagulation function at your ECMO program? Do you follow activated clotting time, ACTs, or do you follow heparin levels? We're back now with Dr. Ravi Thiagarajan, Chief and Callahan Chair of Cardiac Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital. Ravi, that's a terrific overview. Could I take you back uh, to um, uh, the outcome data that you referred to uh, that uh, reveals that uh, patients on VV ECMO have a better outcome than those on VA ECMO? And my question is, is the uh, improved outcomes on VV ECMO, is that association uh, principally explained by the fact that those patients have fewer comorbidities, and in particular, circulatory uh, insufficiency, or is it principally explained by the fact that they have fewer complications than patients on VA ECMO? Um, Jeff, I think you're right. I think patients who have VV ECMO tend to have fewer complications, especially neurological complications, and that's been shown in multiple studies to be the reason why perhaps VV ECMO has better outcomes. The other, uh, the other reason might be is that patients who are supported for VV, with VV ECMO may have less uh, degree of illness or less severity of illness uh, in patients. Fewer comorbidities. And fewer comorbidities. Um, and, um, I you know, patients who require VA ECMO often have both respiratory and cardiac failure, and increasingly we're recognizing there's a cardiac component to, uh, to respiratory failure, and perhaps those are patients who will not be candidates for VV ECMO but really require VA ECMO, and their overall outcomes are already poor given the fact that they have both uh, a component of uh, the respiratory failure has a component of cardiac dysfunction as well. Ravi, I, I wonder if we could turn now and, 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 and discuss in more detail uh, complications on ECMO. Uh, for all of us who uh, practice uh, ECMO therapy, uh, 
even to this day, one of the major concerns is coagulation. It's just so difficult to get it right. Uh, they're either bleeding uh, or they're clotting, and it's a struggle. Um, what do we know uh, about complications? I think um, one of the things about, even though ECMO is life-saving, um, there are many complications that occur as a result of ECMO, and those largely relate to the fact that these patients are critically ill, as well as the patients are being exposed to uh, their blood being drained into uh, a machine and being exposed to um, a, 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 prosthetic, a prosthetic surface that um, triggers um, coagulation uh, and, and inflammation in those patients. Uh, if you look at adverse events and uh, itself, they are more common in the more vulnerable population, which is really the neonates, and more vulnerable in patients who have ECMO for cardiac support, um, because patients with cardiac support often require veno-arterial ECMO, and you're accessing both the venous and the arterial circulation. And by accessing the arterial circulation, you are controlling blood pressure and flow and cardiac output in, in some ways, and also exposing the brain to thrombosis-related complications. I uh, wanted to illustrate a few complications that perhaps are worth discussing. One is mechanical complications, and this is work done through the ELSA registry by Dr. Fleming et al. ECMO has a number of components that have to work well. There's the pump, there's the circuit, there's the oxygenator, and all of those things have to work well for us to be able to do ECMO well. And this paper looked to see what the incidence of mechanical failure was. And it's a really important paper because it helps us understand component failure. Uh, and in this study from the ELSA registry, they looked at 28,000 patients, uh, and they found that 15% of those ECMO runs had mechanical complications. And mechanical complications were more common in patients who were older, uh, patients who had cardiac ECMO, so veno-arterial ECMO, uh, and longer duration of ECMO. And the component that most commonly failed was really the oxygenator. With 7% of the ECMO runs, the mechanical component that failed in those runs was oxygenator failure. Over time, with improvement in technology, some of these component failures have, have decreased and uh, we're able to do better ECMO with improvement in technology. The second complication to really to uh, discuss is, um, this, uh, is bleeding and clotting complications. As we're exposing blood uh, to the circuit and, and prosthesis, we trigger uh, coagulation uh, and also fibrinolysis, so we do both. And then we use uh, anticoagulants to, to uh, prevent thrombosis formation in the ECMO circuit, and both lend to bleeding and clotting complications. And the study that's illustrated here is Dr. Dalton's work, and as you know, Dr. Dalton and is really uh, an important researcher and figure in, in the ECMO world. And she looked at data from the CAPCON centers, uh, which is a research network in pediatrics, uh, and she looked at 2, 000, uh, nearly 2,000 children who were supported with ECMO. And she found that the incidence of bleeding and thrombosis were in the 30 to 40 percent range. And both having a clot or, or bleeding during ECMO increased mortality for those patients. And this illustrates the reason to understand this better in the future, to, to focus more research on bleeding and clotting complications in ECMO, and to really refine our anticoagulation protocols for these patients. And I think the future really lies in improving those, uh, those issues for our ECMO population. And the third and most feared complication really is uh, neurological injury, especially in veno-arterial ECMO because the brain is subject to flow from the ECMO circuit, so um, therefore it's at higher risk for injury. And we're increasingly understanding uh, reasons why neurological complications develop. And this article that's up here uh, is some work done through the ELSA registry again, uh, looking at all newborn babies who were, who were supported back more between 2005 and 2010. There were nearly 7,000 newborn in this study. The incidence of neurological complications, which included brain death, seizures, stroke, and intracranial hemorrhage was about 20%, so quite a high rate of complications and neurological complications in this population. Um, the authors also did a deeper dive into understanding factors associated with neurological complications, and as is expected, children who are premature, uh, whose gestational age is less than 34 weeks, 
uh, where it had a high incidence of bleeding and neurological complications uh, when supported with ECMO. And therefore, we always worry about the children with lower gestational age or premature babies being supported of, on ECMO, and the study kind of uh, lent credit to our concern for those uh, premature babies. Another thing that the study also illustrated was not all neurological complications were related to just bleeding and coagulation, but severity of illness prior to going on ECMO may actually also play a role in the incidence of neurological complications in this, uh, in this population. And what that illustrates to us is that timing of when you start ECMO is a really important component in preventing complications, especially neurological complications in our population. Ravi, with the growth of all these centers, uh, what do we know about the volume outcome relationship in these programs? Is there a volume outcome relationship? Does that hold um, for ECMO centers? And if so, what is the threshold uh, that is the cut point between those who have fewer complications and those who have uh, more complications or better outcomes? Uh, Jeff, yes, there is a volume outcome relationship, and we're increasingly recognizing that as one of the factors that lends to uh, outcomes in ACMO patients. Uh, larger volume centers have better outcomes compared to, uh, to smaller volume centers. The ELSA registry uh, guidelines suggest that every center should do at least six ECMOs a year. However, if you look at the recent literature, um, and I'm going to illustrate one of those here in a minute, um, it, you know, the, the number of cases that you need to do are much higher than, than, than just six cases. This is uh, what I'm illustrating here is work from uh, Dr. Barbero using, again, data from the ELSA registry. Dr. Barbero is the current registry chair and has done an excellent uh, job illustrating the, this, uh, this information. And he used ELSA data between 1989 and 2013. So there were nearly 60,000 patients in this, uh, in this study. And he looked at uh, hospital ECMO volume, uh, which was adjusted for age. And then he adjusted uh, differences of severity of illness uh, as well to examine the relationship between ECMO outcomes and volume. Uh, and we looked at it as a linear relationship. There was a linear relationship in all, all three categories, neonates, pediatrics, and adults. He then took it uh, a step further and broke it down into categories, and he used uh, ECMO center volumes 1 to 5, 6 to 14, 15 to 30, and centers that do, did more than 30 cases of ECMO. And if you looked at the data as a whole, so 1989 to 2013, there was a relationship between the volume, uh, the larger volume centers did better uh, in both neonates and adults. But if you looked at the more recent data, uh, the relationship only persisted in adults. And that kind of fits in with the fact that the adults are now getting back on doing ECMO and perhaps they do have a learning curve as well. It has also been recognized by other works in pediatrics using different databases. Um, there's a study that looked at uh, this outcome relationship using the uh, KID, which is the HRQ administrative data set, and, and there was a uh, relationship demonstrated with that. And then the Pediatric Health Information System database was also used to demonstrate a similar um, uh, volume outcome relationship. Um, so I think it's an important thing. Um, one way centers that are doing less ECMO can compensate is by using uh, educational techniques such as simulation to kind of keep their teams on par uh, so that when they do have an ECMO patient, um, they have good processes and structure and knowledge to manage those patients. So increasingly uh, low volume, uh, increasingly we're investing in educational services uh, and education for, uh, for our ECMO providers so that we would, um, we would do good ECMO even if you're in a low volume center. Um, could I follow up on that? Uh, interesting, you know, the use of uh, simulation. I understand here in Boston um, that you have a program uh, for ECMO simulation, um, and of course I know that it's our, our joint program. But could you tell us about um, the high fidelity ECMO simulator program used here? How is it used? Uh, how often do the faculty go through it? Yeah. So, um, so we have an ECMO simulation program uh, aimed at um, 
teaching providers how to get a patient on ECMO and to manage complications on ECMO. And we uh, do it as a multidisciplinary group, which includes um, our nursing staff, ECMO specialists, uh, IC physicians, uh, our fellows, as well as the surgeons. And they come together as a team uh, to practice getting a patient on uh, ECMO and, to, and managing complications that may occur during that process. Um, we do, um, we use um, a high, a high fidelity mannequin and uh, simulations advanced um, uh, so well that um, you know our surgeons are able to uh, completely simulate um, uh, the surgical uh, aspects of ECMO, and then the IC physicians really focused on managing patients during uh, during that uh, during uh, the surgery that's ne that's required to cannulate patients onto ECMO, um, and and that communication and and teamwork has been really important for us to kind of keep our teams um, fully prepared to manage ECMO, um, uh, patients going on ECMO, as well as managing patients through that process um, and to be able to manage complications. And we may get a requirement for our fellows to go through that so that they're up to date and they can carry the knowledge to other centers that they may go to. And if colleagues write uh, to you from around the world, uh, you would give them details of how this is structured? We would be very happy to help anybody who wants to participate in the simulation program. Uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Allen's really led our, the cardiovascular aspect of uh, ECMO simulation, um, and she's um, showed our simulation program in multiple um, um, large meetings um, with uh, having uh, our um, you know, participants from the audience, um, and it's been a really uh, fantastic endeavor. And similarly, on the uh, pediatric side, Dr. Jill Zalikas is the head of our surgical ECMO program and a um, surgical uh, intensivist as well, and I know she'd be right. willing to share details as well. Finally, Dr. Thea Garajan, um, I wonder if we could turn to the concept of eCPR. Um, could you explain to us formally, what is eCPR? Um, and what do we know about the number of centers who have that capability? And most importantly, what do we know about outcomes from eCPR? eCPR is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation initiated during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So if a patient has a cardiac arrest, you're performing conventional CPR, you haven't established return of circulation, and you think that there's a recoverable lesion and a patient's supported with ECMO so that you could, uh, one, make a diagnosis as well as provide treatment for the reason for cardiac arrest. And this is a growing indication for use of ECMO. Uh, if you look at the registry, and I'm, uh, there are a few slides that are coming up, to show you that the use of ECMO for CPI is growing across the world, and about 20% of all ECMO uh, being done in the world is really for eCPR. Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of actually looking at the ELSA registry data um, uh, to look at eCPR outcomes and who eCPR was being applied to, patient uh, diagnosis, um, and this was a publication that's up in the, uh, the slide up there, shows a publication um, from the ELSA registry data that included 682 patients. Uh, during 1992 to 2005 that was supported with ECMO for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. At the time that we looked at this data, 75% uh, or three quarters of the patients supported with ECMO for CPR were cardiac patients. Uh, so these are children, children who had heart disease. And the majority of these patients had cardiac surgery and then had a cardiac arrest during their post-operative period and they were supported with ECMO. A quarter of the patients had other medical diseases, which included accidental injuries such as toxin exposure or ECMO to support um, patients who had been exposed to trauma. Uh, some patients had respiratory failure, both pediatric and neonatal respiratory failure. So although the majority of patients were supported for cardiac indications, a quarter of the patient had non-cardiac reasons to go on ECMO. Overall survival in this cohort was 38%, um, and since then the survival's improved because we know how to operationalize uh, getting a patient on ECMO during cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and we've learned a few things, and I'm going to illustrate some of those things here. Um, one of the things um, is that ECMO is only a support mechanism, so you have to recognize and provide good cardiopulmonary resuscitation prior to placing a, a patient on ECMO, because ECMO is not going to save somebody who has uh, had a cardiac arrest that was not recognized or didn't have good, good quality of CPR. 
So when we looked at our data from the ELSA registry, we demonstrated that patients who had low pH uh, had higher risk of mortality, or patients who had high pH had lower risk of mortality. And what that suggested to us was that perhaps uh, these patients either had um, you know, more severe illness coming into their cardiac arrest or acquired metabolic acidosis during their cardiac arrest, which lends to um, the fact that perhaps some of these patients were not supported well with cardiopulmonary resuscitation prior to ECMO. We also looked at patients who died, um, as illustrated in this slide here, in this cohort of patients uh, who had eCPR. 52% of patients died within 72 hours after going on ECMO. And we think that the reasons why these patients might have died was because, not because of ECMO, but really because of what happened to them coming into ECMO or, or being, prior to being supported on ECMO. And in fact, when we looked at the number of patients who, had, who met criteria for brain death, uh, patients who died within 72 hours um, had a higher proportion of patients who died because of brain death, suggesting that uh, perhaps brain death was acquired as um, uh, related to the quality of CPR that was provided for these patients prior to going on ECMO. So the most important thing with eCPR really is to provide good quality CPR, and I'm going to illustrate how ECMO works for CPR in the slide here. Uh, we recognize cardiac arrest in four phases, pre-arrest, no flow phase, and this is a time when you're actually recognizing and diagnosing cardiac arrest prior to starting chest compressions. You create a low flow phase during active CPR, and then there's a post-resuscitation phase. ECMO only helps during the low flow phase, and it, uh, and it doesn't help you recognize arrest or provide good quality CPR. So really the essential aspects to success uh, in eCPR is really recognition and providing good quality CPR. Uh, and getting a patient on ECMO efficiently uh, during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. ECMO can also help you provide certain post-resuscitation therapies. One, it helps you provide a good perfusion pressure so that your organs are well perfused. Uh, it can also help you provide um, other therapies such as targeted temperature management because you can manage temperature very well on ECMO. Um, and this is an area of ECMO that's really growing. There's increasing interest in, um, in supporting patients who have cardiac arrest but haven't uh, had return of circulation, and you think that they may have something that could be uh, that could be treated. For example, in adults um, who have um, um, coronary artery disease who present with ventricular fibrillation, uh, those adults could be supported during uh, CPR, especially if you can't convert them uh, their ventricular fibrillation uh, with CPR and 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 defibrillation. Um, you can support them on ECMO, and then they can go to the CAT lab where a coronary lesion can be intervened upon, um, and you can reperfuse the heart, um, and um, you know you can in many you can recover them uh, with uh, with ECMO support for their organs. Uh, so this is really a growing use of ECMO uh, in the world. This slide illustrates the growth of ECMO. The red bars on these slides show um, that about 20%, like I said, of the current uses of ECMO are for eCPR. The increases across all age groups, neonates, pediatrics, and adults, perhaps more in adults than other populations. Uh, but we've done this for a long time. I think we're getting better at deploying ECMO during CPR. Our, our assimilation training is largely geared towards getting the team together to be able to do this efficiently. We've used that to kind of keep, uh, keep our teams very well trained to get patients on ECMO uh, efficiently during CPR, and that's really lent to our success. In the cardiovascular program, um, our overall survival is between 40 and 50 percent, and these are patients that if you didn't have ECMO and you didn't have return of circulation during conventional CPR, they are facing imminent mortality. So we're able to rescue 40 to 50% of these patients. There are many issues with eCPR. Clearly, neurological injury is of big concern. And I think we can potentially mitigate uh, some of those um, issues, uh, such as neurological injury, by providing good quality CPR. So eCPR is only as good as the CPR that you provide. Uh, and it's a really crucial aspect of uh, eCPR. The growth of eCPR is across the world. There are many centers in the world, and I'm going to illustrate this with a map here, that are doing eCPR, and it is probably going to be one of those things that will continue to grow over time. And, and just briefly, um, as you well know, the uh, eCPR is dependent on having a skilled surgeon 
uh, as well as a, an experienced team to rapidly cannulate. Um, but in, in your program in the cardiac ICU at Boston Children's Hospital, um, a patient uh, has a circulatory arrest, is getting CPR. When do you activate eCPR? So there's wide variability across uh, across centers as to when they activate eCPR, and there's still no real uh, definition of failed conventional CPR. So we've but what we have done here is that we have a time period where we think that we should activate um, ECMO. Uh, and we usually say, if you haven't had return of circulation after five minutes of cardiopulmonary resuscitation and one dose of epinephrine, you really need to get um, ready to get patients on ECMO. So we usually call at five minutes uh, or after the first dose of epinephrine. In the ICU, uh, we we know our patients very well. There may be some patients that you know will not uh, respond well to conventional CPR, and for those patients, we might even call earlier than um, and, and then waiting for the full five minutes. Um, and um, and some of this is you know good communication, um, having a, a clear plan as to how you might uh, manage cardiac arrest in our patients, uh, and we. Uh, this is one of the aspects uh, that we focus on during daily rounds. Uh, you know, this patient arrests, how quickly should we call ECMO? Or is this patient a candidate at all for eCPR? You know, some patients have non-recoverable uh, forms of congenital heart disease that might not lend to good outcomes even with ECMO support. So in those patients, eCPR is futile. So to have to make those decisions has really helped us uh, be consistent with our practice uh, to know ahead of time because these are things that you're not, you don't want to decide at the time things are happening. You want to have a little bit of a preamble to it and a, a, and, a, and a consistent thought process that you've talked to everybody and you're ready to go when the event happens. Um, so we've been very blessed to have a, uh, have a team that helps us uh, decide um, and, um, and operationalize eCPR very efficiently. Um, we have an in-house surgeon, uh, a surgical fellow um, who is very well versed in cannulation. So uh, we're one of those um, centers that have, uh, are blessed with excellent infrastructure to do this well. Um, and we've done this for many years now, um, and um, it, you know, we've done this quite well. I'd like to stop now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. And the question is this. At your ECMO program, what imaging modality do you use to determine optimal ECMO cannula position? That is, after cannulation, do you use chest x-ray to determine and assess the adequacy of ECMO cannula position, or do you rely on echocardiography? We're back now with Dr. Thea Garajan, professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and chief and Callahan chair of cardiac critical care at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, one last question on this, um, and of course I know you don't have any data to answer this, but just broadly speaking, in your experience with eCPR in your program in the last 15 years, roughly how many patients um, would you say are, you know, quote, candidates, people that you would put on uh, if they have a cardiac arrest, and, and roughly how many patients um, would you say um, we have, you, you have determined to be not uh, uh, good candidates for ECMO should they have a cardiac arrest? Right. Two-thirds, one-third? Uh, how, how would you give that breakdown? I, I would say uh, two-thirds of our patients in our unit with cardiac arrest uh, are candidates for eCPR. And there are uh, specific, um, specific diseases that don't lend to good outcomes for CPR. Like for example, patients who have primary pulmonary hypertension, um, who have no intraatrial communication, CPR for those patients is not effective because if you have obstruction in your lungs, you're not going to fill the left side of the heart. So in those patients often have severe neurological injury. So they are not good candidates for uh, CPR. Similarly, Patients with uh, severe atrioventricular valve, uh, if you have a single ventricle patient with severe atrioventricular valve dysfunction so that they have a whole, um, you know, severe regurgitation of the atrioventricular valve, doing chest compressions on those patients often sends blood into the atrium rather than out the outflow tract. So those patients are at high risk for neurological injury. And um, patients with the uh, Glenn and the Fontan uh, circulation often have high venous pressures, uh, and therefore providing good cerebral perfusion for those patients during uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation is quite challenging. Uh, so those patients, we think very carefully as to whether they are candidates or not for CPR. 
um, ECMO support during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. However, our default uh, sometimes is to support them with the knowledge that they may have severe neurological injury. And once we've stabilized the circulation is to investigate, to see, uh, to decide on the extent of neurological injury um, and to whether continuing ECMO is, uh, is the best option for that patient. Um, so um, so th those, are, uh, those are challenges in this population. Um, we try to include as many as possible uh, to provide best amount of support for those patients so we understand the reason for their cardiac arrest to explore every option to see that there's nothing reversible uh, for these patients um, and to also um, and to also know that if you have severe neurological injury then at some point we need to uh, stop ECMO or limit ECMO. I'd like to stop now and ask our colleagues around the world a question and the question is this if your program has an eCPR program at what point, at what time into cardiac arrest do you activate eCPR? Dr. Ravi Fiagarajan, I think I speak for colleagues around the world in thanking you for your research uh, in this area and help us, helping us to understand really um, when is ECMO useful, uh, what are the outcomes associated with it, and as um, you always remind me, ECMO is a support, it's not a therapy, um, and that we have to use it uh, judiciously. So thank you for sharing your knowledge um, on World Shared Practice Forum today. Thank you very much, Jeff. This is such a pleasure to do this. Thank you very much.